Well, good morning. Today, I want to uh, share with you guys from the idea and the thought, don't give up your seat. Don't give up your seat. Now, I know that's kind of uh, contradictory to what I would tell you here in the church if there were too many people and those who are considering this your home, if someone comes in, you should be giving up your seat. But I'm talking about something a little different today in the scriptures, and we're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter 1. We're going to move from verse 18 into chapter 2, uh, verse 7. That's Ephesians 1, 18, moving into chapter 2, verse 7. If you're ready, say amen. One more time, if you're ready, say amen. amen. All right, we're going to get right into it. Ephesians 1, starting in verse 18. You can follow along on the screens with me. It says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader, anything else. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church, and that is you and I. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. Moving on into chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God, but God is so rich in mercy and loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. That's something to be excited about, amen? It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead, get this, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because you are united with Christ Jesus. Verse 7, to close, it says, So God can point to us in all future ages of examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your mercy. We pray today, Lord God, that you would touch the heart of your people, God, for we know you want to do that. And I pray that change would come in this house. Lord, I pray for your servant as he speaks your word. May he speak nothing more, nothing less, only what you would have him to speak today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, Ephesians, um, it is a book that shares so much of what we've been given as believers in Jesus Christ. It shares so much of what we have Overcome, And I want to say this about Ephesians. It is a book of victory. It is a book of victory. And I don't mean to just come out of the gate and start and be offensive, but I want to challenge you with this, that if you are a, a, a down person in nature, maybe a, a depressed per person in nature, and you're spending all your time in the book of Psalms, you need to stop. You need to just go ahead and stop right now, and you need to get yourself in the book of Ephesians and become an overcomer so you can parallel that nature that you are with, with the power that he's given us. Now, Psalms has its place, okay? I, I, it's almost like you ask three-fourths of the church, what's your favorite book? Psalms, you know, because we have his one-liners, and when we're feeling down, we, we, we read David, and it's like, well, see, David was down too. It's okay. It's not okay to stay there. David hid in caves, and he, he dwelt in, in, in places far away from others, and oftentimes he would write these songs and these psalms from, from his heart, and sometimes even from a place of darkness, but he always came to the light. So I think it's really important to have that balance in the scripture to know that God is, yes, with you in your weakness, but he's also given you a great strength 
in Christ Jesus. So if you're that kind of person, you need to get to Ephesians and realize who you are. Because if you're like me and you read Ephesians, I've been reading it this week, obviously, and uh, it has wrecked me. It's, it's wrecked me because uh, it is contrary to, to my nature. Have you ever read God's word and it, it, it kind of comes against you? Why? Because it's against that sinful nature that's within you, and it's against that nature that says, well, I'm nothing, I'm never gonna be anything, I'm never gonna be able to live for God, I'm never gonna be good enough, I'm comparing myself to someone else, and maybe, maybe I don't seem as, uh, 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 as spiritual as this other person. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and so often in our Christian experience, we can walk in a down manner because we don't know who we are. Uh, the, the verse I wanna cling to today is Ephesians chapter two, verse six. If we could bring that up there, I wanna just kinda settle in here just for a little bit. I don't even think that's the right word because I don't think you can read Ephesians and settle in anywhere. But it says, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Now, I just, I just put these up here just for a quick reference. I want you to get the picture that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. You say, listen, that, that's, that sounds cultish, man. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we are seated with Christ in heavenly realms. That we are, if you first read the first part of that, it says that he seated Christ at the right hand of God, okay? And then he seated us with Christ. So we are seated with Christ at the right hand of God in heavenly realms. Now, that will destroy every part of you that wants to say, well, uh, great things should be set aside for just the spiritual elite. No, 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 no. It's talking about the church, those who are with him, in a relationship with him. So I want to ask you this question today, and that is, where are you sitting? Where are you sitting? If you're a very literal person, you're like, well, man, I'm right here, you know, in these nice fold-down seats. No, where are you sitting Spiritually speaking, I don't want you to misunderstand my statement uh, that follows, but I certainly want you to think about this statement. Are you ready? Are you ready? I, I wonder how many of us are clinging to the cross and missing the overcoming power of the resurrection. I wonder how many of us are clinging to the cross and missing the overcoming power of the resurrection. Now listen, I want you to understand the cross was and is vital to our faith. Amen. We must have the cross, right? But we must not forget the resurrection. It, it, it seems like everything stops at the cross, now, if you don't hear this message all the way through, you, you will certainly leave this place today a little misunderstood. I will certainly leave a little misunderstood to you in your mind because a great deal of the church revolves around the cross, and that's fantastic. It has to be there. But here's one thing I think we forget is that there is a resurrection. There, there's not just the death, but there's the resurrection. And somehow we have glorified the death and left out the resurrection, especially when it comes to our spiritual lives. We want to stay at the cross. And here, I'm not here to dismantle your theology or, or upbringing or anything like that, but, but I want to say the cross is a good place to remember. It's a good place, you say, to sit at the feet of Jesus on the cross. It's like, he's not there. He, he's not on the cross. He rose again from the grave. Amen? That's, that's, what, that's what puts the power in our faith. Now, I don't want you all to go home today and like take off your crosses and, and somehow get a laser thing and remove your cross that you put on your arm. Just keep it. It's awesome. The cross is great. All right? Everybody's like, man, do I got to go get that tattoo lasered off? No, just keep it. The cross is fantastic. All right? But listen, don't, don't leave out the power of the resurrection. So I want to ask again, where are you sitting? I want to clarify that I do not believe it is God's intention for us to walk around with heads down defeated. I, I do not believe that is God's intention for us to stay there. I believe that there are times when we walk through defeat, 
There are times when we will walk through difficulty, but my Bible doesn't leave me there. I only stay there if I stay there. Are you with me? I, I only stay there, and I, I don't have victory if I decide that I don't want to set where Christ has seated with me, uh, me in heavenly places. He seated me with Christ in heavenly places. Where are you setting? The reason Jesus came was to bring life and victory, not add heaviness. I want to say that again. The reason Jesus came was to bring life he actually said to bring life more abundant, which we'll talk about in a few moments, and victory, not to add heaviness. So my question oftentimes is and has been really, it, it has been a, a little bit of a holy frustration of mine, if you will, for many years that Christians act so defeated. They act so down as if they've, they've never measured up and they can never. Guess what? You're never going to. That is the importance of Jesus Christ. And I feel like no matter how many times I say that, we got to be reminded again that you can't. You can't overcome, but through Christ, you can overcome. Are you with me? And I think many believers walk around defeated and depressed and, oh, I'm never going to amount. Listen, cling to what Jesus has done, not just the cross, but the resurrection. You know, there is purpose in where we're meant to be seated. Remember, where we're meant to be seated is with Christ, the right hand of God in heavenly realms. Some of you are going to be stuck on that probably for the rest of the day and hopefully for the rest of the week because it's kind of messed me up a little bit. And I, and I think to myself often, we, we always sing about the cross. Very rarely do we sing about the resurrection. Very rarely do we sing about the resurrecting power of Jesus. We love the cross. And listen, I love the cross. Amen. I love the cross. But I also love the resurrection because the resurrection is what gives power to my faith in Jesus. There is a purpose in where we're meant to be seated. And this is three quick things. The purpose is this, to show his redemptive power. Everything we do, everything we believe should be all about his redemptive power. I believe that everything God does is redemptive. The New Testament is redemptive. Are you with me? It redeems fallen man to the place he designed in the beginning. Are you with me? That See, the fall of Adam, what he did was he, he left his place. Sin made him leave his place. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself now, but sin made him leave his place. Are you with me? And it has been God's intention from the beginning to get man back to the place he designed him to in the beginning, which is in relationship. And the only way that that could happen it's not through law and not through rules and regulations, which God had to set the law up so man would know what sin is and what sin was and make us understand our sinful nature. But then enter Jesus, who took on sin for us, took on shame for us. And so when he hung on the cross, also that sin and that shame, which is ours, hung on him too. So I wonder why if Jesus, we, we even say Jesus took our sins, he took our shame, then why are you carrying it? He took our sin, he took our shame. Well, why, why are you still thinking about it when you say he cleansed you of your sins and yet you're still, you, you won't take your seat because you say, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough of the seat. Jesus is good enough, that's why you're able to sit there. You see, there is purpose in where we're meant to be seated. And secondly, it is to show his grace and his kindness toward humanity. I gotta watch myself because I gotta stay a little bit on track today. Uh, his kindness toward us is what leads us to repentance. And I think the church at times has really messed this thing up and made it about control and fear. People that come to Christ out of control and fear, they don't usually go the long haul because you can't walk too long in that controlling and fearful attitude toward God. It will break you down. It will buckle you down. But when you come to him and you realize the kindness of who he is. Now, I want to say, when I came to Christ, that, listen, there was a little bit of that factor, like, I just didn't want to go to hell. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I just don't want to, I would like to go to heaven and not hell. Amen. There is that. But then, as I started walking with Jesus a little bit, I realized, like, is, is my relationship, is the sum of my relationship just the fact that I don't want to go to hell? Because that's weak. 
And I've even had people tell me that in the past, like, don't be afraid to preach hell. We, listen, hell's real, and I think inside of every person, they know that. God's created us with that, with that nature to know that there is heaven, that there is hell, even if people try to deny that. So I don't think people need to remind them of that a whole lot. You know why? Because hell will control and give fear, but Christ and his kindness is what will actually set you free into a relationship with him. If you come to Christ just out of the idea that, oh, man, I don't want to go to hell, you, you will miss it. And if you came to him because of that, I want you to begin now to begin to tap into who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for you and, and to show you that there's life and there's life more abundant and you shouldn't be walking around controlled by fear. That is the devil. If you are controlled by fear, even of God, you are controlled by that nature. Listen, that's not the fear God's talking about when he says, fear me. It's a reverence. It's an honor. It's an adoration. So when I stand before God and I lift up my hands to him, I stand before him in fear knowing who he is. He is the holder of my soul, but I'm in a relationship with him, knowing that his desire and his design for me is for me to walk with him. Are you with me? Amen. Notice also it says that, that God seated us with him. This speaks of relationship. It speaks of relationship. It, it's, it's God's intention to have a relationship. The ultimate purpose of Jesus was to bring us again into relationship with God. I want, I want to tell you this. Take it or leave it. Listen, you know that, right? You can take or leave anything I say because I'm just a man. Okay, but what the word says you need to really take it. Don't leave it. Take it. Are you with me? I want, I want you to be very clear on that. So everything I'm saying today, go ahead, go home and, ch and challenge what you're hearing. I want you to get a hold of it for yourself. Don't just listen to someone. That's been the problem is that everybody just listens to so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so and, -so and grandpa and grandma and, and, and aunt and uncle, and they don't read the word for themselves, and then you grow up believing a theology that is not God's theology. That's the issue. People don't know who they are in Christ because they've never experienced it for themselves. The ultimate purpose of Jesus was to bring us again into relationship with God. Salvation, salvation is a byproduct of relationship. It should not be the sole purpose of why I chose to follow Jesus. Salvation is a byproduct of relationship. We might have come to God for salvation, but it pales in comparison to the relationship he intended for us. Listen, salvation pales in comparison to the relationship that he set aside for us, for those who believe right now. Not, not in the days to come, right now. Are you with me? If you, if you remember the prayer, I grew up Methodist, so I know it by heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is my favorite part on earth as it is in heaven. It doesn't say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done when I die and reach the great by and by. No, no, no. I know there's probably a hymn that rhymes and sounds like that. It sounds real cool. We probably sang it our whole life, and it's wrong. Because now, and I'm really happy, by the way. I just want you guys to know that. Like, really pumped right now. Like, listen, now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Now. I love that. Why do we give up our seat? Let me go through just, just a couple reasons why we give up this seat. I need to do some cardio, man, I think. I think this message is telling me I need to do some cardio. So why do we give up our seat? I think a lot of us give up our seat because of sin and shame, first and foremost. We forget that he died and rose to give us victory over both, over sin and shame. It is, a, it is a great frustration of mine to see a believer that knows Jesus Christ and that is in fellowship with him continue to carry and walk with shame because that was not God's intention for us. It wasn't. It isn't. He wants us to give it to him. Something else that I think we give up our seat for is the natural and the now. So often we can get too attached to the things we see right in front of us to our lives and what we think is most important. Amen? The natural, the now, it makes us forget. Once again, why do we give up our seat? And this is huge, this is huge. The opinion of man. 
the opinion of man. I honor each and every person that has poured into my life. I, I, I honor the men and women of God that have spoke in, into my life and over my life and have encouraged me and have taught me great things. I mean, from the time it started even when I was little to now, little things. You know, you just pick up little things. Some, sometimes one person might just give you one line that you remember now forever, right? And that's awesome, and you need to honor that. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You cannot allow the opinion of man and what you've been taught by others to rule you. The word of God is so very important in your life. Many people have given up their seat because of the opinion of man. One of the greatest travesties in the church is people not understanding God's heart for them greatly because of what they've been taught, even within the confines of Scripture and the church. Because sometimes we can read one Scripture and make an entire doctrine out of it, and God did not intend us to do that. He intended it to build on each other. Oftentimes we will focus in on one verse and we'll say, well, this is what God wants to do, and we'll make a pattern out of God and all of his word because of this one verse that we like to gravitate toward, this one verse that we like. We'll, we'll, we'll zero in on that and say, this is doctrine. No, that's one piece of God. And people will use, use statements like this. Well, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Newsflash, he is, you aren't. You weren't born all-knowing. You weren't born where you could be everywhere and know everything at all times, so give it up. If there's any preachers, including myself in the house today, that believes that, give it up. You ain't that smart. I know ain't's not even a word. That's the point I'm trying to make. We, we can't put a patent on God. The opinion of man will wreck you if you allow it. Why do we give up our seat? False humility. False humility. Now, false humility does not mean prideful. I do not mean that in this instance. Many times people slide into this category because it is uncomfortable to think that God would do anything with us. I'm just trying to stay, like, out of trouble right now. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I'm just an old sinner. You gonna stay there? You gonna keep staying there? You're just an old you're just an old sinner. Last time I checked, he gave me a seat. He gave me a seat. Right here. He gave me a seat. And and I I, I can't. I can't. The, the spirit man inside of me can't just say, Oh, I'm just an old sinner. I can't I just can't I just can't say it anymore. I can't. Now. Does that sinful nature come on up? You better, yes, absolutely, amen and amen. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But, but, but I will not diminish, I will not diminish what Jesus did for me because of sin. He still did it. And that's why he did it. That's why he did it, is so we could overcome that nature that rises up within us. If, if you are one that says this, well, I'm nothing without him. Listen, I, I pray that prayer often. I'm nothing without him, but I've often forgot this, that I'm something when I'm with him. I'm nothing, and we even have some of my favorite songs. We sing, we're nothing without you. It is a reminder we're nothing, but we are something with Jesus. <laughs> I can do nothing in and of myself outside of his grace, outside of his mercy, but man, I'm something. With him. And you know why we don't want to say that? Oh, well, that's kind of prideful. It's Bible. Don't call God prideful. It's who he's called us to be, to set with him. Man. Woo. All right. Why do we give up our seat? Just to name a few other things, just real quick, just in passing. The past, lust, busyness, distraction. The list goes on, doesn't it? I mean, we, we give up our seat for a lot of different reasons, right? We just do. We, we just do. Why does this matter? Why does all this matter? Because life depends on it. Wow, that's a little dramatic. Life depends on it. Why does it matter where I'm sitting? Because life depends on it. Listen, your life depends on it. I'm not talking about your death. I'm not talking about heaven and hell right now. 
Your life depends on it. Jesus said, I'll give you life and life more abundantly. Life and life more abundantly. So don't, don't minimize that to, oh, well, one day I'll get to go to heaven. No, live for him now. Your life depends on it. Listen, the life of others depends on it. The life of the church depends on it. John 10.10, 10, once again, just to kind of uh, reference that, is that Jesus gave us life and life more abundant. Here's the thing. Like, I tried to get real, real deep and theological. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to break out the strongest concordance. You know, it kind of breaks down the Greek and Hebrew and stuff. I'm like, I'm going to just bust out some cool word, you know, just say, say what life, this is what life means in the Greek, and you guys are going to be like, oh, he's so theological. You know it's not true, though, right? It's like, oh, he's, this guy, so deep, knows Greek. I don't, I don't. So I looked up the word life, and I'm expecting this grand definition. If any of you have ever done this, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You look up this word life, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be so deep, man. And people, their minds are going to be blown when I, when I unveil this word. And I looked up life, what he meant there in John 10, 10, and it said this, life. That's what it meant. That's what it said. That's it. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I got that up. I looked up number 2,228 and, and, and went, scrolled down and got over it. I got the Greek number, so I went back and I was like, I did all that to know that life means life? But isn't it true sometimes we try to make, we try to make something out of nothing and all this, and, and it's really just simple. Life. Life depends on it. Your life, the life of others, the life of the church, life more abundant. You, I don't even have to describe to you what life is. You know it, right? You can sense it. You can just see someone living life and really being, being vibrant and victorious, and you can say they're living life. I mean, you, can, you see that imagery everywhere. They put it on commercials. They put it on TV shows. You can just see people living. And what, it, what does it do? It inspires you to actually live life. And so when I read Ephesians, that's what I do is I come alive to what life really is. That my walk with Jesus is not just about my death, it's about my life. Yes, I died to myself, but I'm living to Christ. I'm living with Christ in God. Are you with me? Life's valuable. Life is valuable. Our death certainly can't sum up our life. I've been to a lot of funerals. I've done a lot. You know, we, we're always trying to sum up someone's life. You can't do it. You try, try to might, use a nice verse and say a couple nice things. It don't mean nothing. It really doesn't. Because those who know us, they know. They know the life that we have, the, the, the life that we're about. They can sense it when they're around us. It's something that's even sensed and felt. Whether you have life. Listen, know who you are in Christ. I'm telling you, it'll, it'll, it'll bring you alive in him. May we not have so much and live like we have nothing at all. May we not have so much and live like we have nothing at all. I, I'm going to ask the band to come up and, uh, and play a, a title of a song that I really love. It's called Resurrecting. You get it? You see how that ties in? Because, because I believe that he didn't just die for us, but he lived for us, and he showed us how to live. Are you with me? I want to tell you the stories there, a little stories that are coming up. How many have ever heard of the Witch of Wall Street? Anybody heard of the Witch of Wall Street back in the late 1800s? One back here. Anybody, anybody at all with the Witch of Wall Street? Not the Wolf of Wall Street like the movie, but it's kind of like that, but the Witch of Wall Street. Anybody at all know what I'm talking about? Hetty Green, anybody heard that term before? Okay, great. Well, I'm just going to tell you this little story. It's great. You don't know it, so I'll get to tell you now. It's fantastic. You don't know if I'm off or not, but you can look it up now on Google because they got all the answers. That's where I found it too. So, Hetty Green was a woman who was born in the 1800s. She died in the early 1900s. And uh, she, was, she was given the name the Witch of Wall Street. In that time and in that era, she was the wealthiest woman in America. The wealthiest woman in America. But there was something interesting about her is that you couldn't tell by looking at her. You couldn't tell by looking at her. She, she wore... Uh, this just nasty old filthy black dress. She was so tight and so frugal that uh, she would have her people just wash the dirty parts of her dress. She would only wear the one dress and she'd wash the dirty parts of the dress to save money on soap. I mean, we're talking Dave Ramsey to the nth degree. So 
So, but it, it goes even deeper than that. And I want to just go ahead and tell you right now, this is not a good story. Okay, I'm not trying to let you to aspire to be Hetty Green, the Woods of Wall Street, because she was so tight that her son even at one point had some kind of issue with his leg. He scraped it and it got infected. And they went to a doctor, a free clinic, because she didn't want to pay for medicine. And they found out who she was and they tried to charge her a $150 fee to get the boy's leg fixed and she got mad and stormed off. Later in life, the boy actually ended up losing his leg because his mother denied him care. You see what I'm saying? She had everything. In that time, it was millions and millions of dollars that she had. And if I'm not mistaken, they said in today's currency, she would have been a billionaire. Something like $3.8 billion she would have been worth in that time. Are you with me? She, she lived in old broken down apartments. She never turned on hot water. She never turned on the heat. You just put extra clothes on. When she married her husband, she said, you have to sign this agreement that you will get none of my money, none of my inheritance. She made the kids' spouses sign an agreement that you can get none of this money, none of the inheritance. She died a billionaire in today's currency. What am I, why am I telling you the story about the Witch of Wall Street? Because she had so much, yet used nothing at all. She had so much, and she used nothing at all. She had, she had not put her wealth into action. You see, in Jesus, we've been given great wealth. We, we've been given a seat. That's the best seat in the house. And here's the deal. He don't want us to give it up. He, he actually wants us to have other people join us in the seat to understand what life is, life more abundant. We're the wealthiest people on the planet. Let's make sure we don't live like it, or we, we don't live like it. We're the wealthiest people on the planet. We have great riches in Christ. May we be sure that we don't give up everything just because of ourselves. Let's not be a picture of this in our spiritual life. Amen, church. Man, we've been given so much. All this is just to encourage you, to spur you, and to challenge you. Listen, think about who you are in Jesus. Don't look at your, yourself the way that everybody told you you were. Don't, don't even look at your upbringing. Maybe some of your upbringing, you, you, you were told you were nothing. You weren't going to amount to nothing. Don't listen to that. No the wealth that you have in Jesus. Amen. Life and life more abundant. Having so much and giving it up is such a travesty, isn't it? So what I want to do in this place today is I would just love to stand and I want to sing this song. You can stand your feet. I want to sing this song called Resurrecting. And I want you to really understand the magnitude of what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. What he gave you on the cross and the resurrection. Let's sing it out.